Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Mark Pilling here from Flight Global on the latest, the second actually, Aviation Sustainability Webinar of 2023. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I hope you've got your cups of tea, your water, ready for an hour of great debate, conversation, and intelligence about the advanced air mobility sector. I'm going to be your moderator, of course, today, and we're partnering with the webinar this today with Pratt & Whitney, familiar to all of you as it's for its industry leading propulsion technology and its commitment, of course, to aviation sustainability. Now, we're going to welcome questions, of course, from you, the audience. So please post them on the Q&A piece of the functionality here on Zoom. And we'll try and answer them as we go along and also at the end, moderated by my colleague, Murdo Morrison. So. In today's webinar, we're delving for the first time, actually, into advanced air mobility. It's an emerging sector, it's seeing the development of aircraft with propulsion technologies that will enable a new class of travel with fundamentally lower emissions and fundamentally perhaps lower costs, maybe lower maintenance costs, lower noise, etc. We'll talk about all of that, I'm sure. Now, but for advanced air mobility to turn from a fascinating prospect to a sound commercial reality, there are a myriad of questions to answer and problems to solve. Luckily, we're not going to do that on our own. We've got four industry experts with us to help. So I'm delighted to welcome today to the webinar, David Rotblatt, who is a Senior Vice President of Sales, Marketing and Government Affairs at EVE Air Mobility. Welcome, Dave. He's in Florida at the Embraer headquarters in Melbourne, Florida. Uh, we've got Andrew McMillan, the Chief Commercial Officer of Vertical Aerospace. Welcome to you, Andrew, very much. It's good, great to see you. We've got Eric Barsh, the Chief Executive of Vertigo, an entrepreneurial, he's the founder of Vertigo, an entrepreneurial propulsion company, which has had investment from Raytheon Technologies as well. And then finally, we've got Dave Stepanek, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Transformation Officer I always love that title, Dave. You've got something to transform and you're the man to do it at Bristow Helicopters. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Now, after our successful trial format in March, we're continuing with the Dragon's Den or I'm reliably informed in the US or other regions, it's the Shark Tank format. Now, in each, what, each one of our experts will take two minutes presenting an elevator pitch on an aspect of their technology or their innovation, and then we'll debate it as a panel for the following eight minutes. Uh, we won't have any voting or bidding, I'm afraid. No cash for your ideas, uh, everybody. Uh, but the aim is to probe, probe mm -hmm. and investigate each innovation and test <coughs> the idea on offer. Now, my laptop is just, no, here it's back, that's right. And then at the end, we're going to summarise all the, um, the questions going on there. So let me just get my laptop. My laptop has just blanked off for a second, which is obviously not very welcome. So let's go into the den. Dave, you're going to be our first dragon. You're going to be the first shot. Um, you're going to tell us about, you've got two minutes. Let me get my timer on. Over to you, Dave. Thank, th thank, you, thank you, Mark. Uh, Bristow, if, if, you, if you know the helicopter business, has been in this industry for 75 years working in the vertical space. Our vision is to be innovators in sustainable vertical flight solutions, uh, leaders in that, in that industry, which we do today. So as this revolutionary technology was being developed, uh, we recognize that this is an industry that we want to be part of. In fact, we think we can, we can help bring it over the goal line into operations. So from as revolutionary technologies are developed, uh, they have to go through the production process as after the certification and into, into operations, the three scopes of, of, the, of the licenses. And we wanna be part of that process and help lead it uh, and, and be a leader in the industry as well. So what we do in, in our set last 75 years in innovation of vertical lift is all the intellectual property that we've built up, the fact that we operate a large fleet of aircraft in a global environment, and we operate in 16 different countries in every air, major airworthiness regulator's uh, backyard. Uh, we've partnered with a, a number of companies for, for various reasons, for their types of, of certification, for their performance, for the... Um, the missions that we believe that we'll be able to, 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 to meet. And we also know that, uh, you know, it's important for Bristow to be in the sustainability side. And we believe this is gonna be a very, very good business. It's gonna open up markets to Bristow that couldn't be addressed by 
uh, traditional helicopters, whether it's cost or noise or accessibility. So as you can see, we have a, a large fleet. None of these, none of these, none of the, none of this is just a bet to see if one comes out. We we intend to operate all of the vehicles and 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 probably a, a great number more. We operate twelve different uh, aircraft today. So this is just the beginning for us. And we also want to help the the OEMs that are building these bring this to the commercial reality for, through the our ability to launch new products that we've done in the past. If you could just uh, slip to the next slide. Please. It will go. There we are. Oh, there we go. So this is where I think we really come in. Um, evolution of safety. So we've got revolutionary technology, and we believe that Bristow and companies like Bristow are the intersection of revolution and evolution. We've evolved over 75 years of safety. All the safety that you enjoy at commercial air carriers today has evolved over 120 years, and it doesn't happen immediately. So you have the th three components to uh, major uh, operations. You have the technology. We buy safe, safe equipment, all the latest technologies, all the latest standards. We have management systems to manage those tools that we buy, those aircraft that we buy and, and, and operate. But to really get to zero, to get to a, a the, the culture that we all enjoy in air carriers today, it, it takes that safety culture, that know-how, that understanding of the processes and procedures that, that need to take place. Um, and that is that equation of accident rate over time. As you can see, this is Dr. Patrick Hudson from, from Cranfield University. It's been my mantra of safety for over 20 years here. And, and we believe that we apply that as our culture is already there in the vertical lift space. And we want to bring that to this industry to help make it reality. That's my elevator pitch. Dave, thank you very much. Well, great. So, but David. So fundamentally, do you think AAM, AAM type platforms, vehicles can be actually just a degree, a mag degree of magnitude safer than the helicopters say? The thesis should be that it is because you have you're taking. Well, first of all, you're 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 adding more rotor systems in many cases. You're you're removing that single point of failure of the of the main rotor and the drivetrain system. But you're taking away a lot of material, a lot of parts that are rotating on a traditional helicopter. So if you think about a drivetrain transmission, you got to transverse it to a tail rotor, you've got turbine engines that have to input to a gearbox, you have all the hydraulics, all the all the liquid heat, heat and cooling, that comes out. And all those, when you take out all those major components, all that drivetrain, that should equate to higher reliability and higher safety, and likely a lower cost uh, uh, as well. So a lot, a lot of heating and cooling going on, a lot, a lot of vibration. Right. Yeah. Great. Dave, Dave Rotblat, d d you know, you're nodding away there. Just come in with your thought on 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 Dave's, you know, sure. Dave's thesis there. So I, I think um, what almost every eVTOL manufacturer has embraced from a design perspective is this idea of distributed electric propulsion. So exactly what Dave said, we're removing essentially that that dependency on that one main rotor. Uh, in the tail rotor and instead spreading it across multiple rotors that that will not only distribute the the let's say vertical and horizontal component of lift but also to make sure that should a rotor fail you still have several others that can help the aircraft safely find uh, a safe landing place if it needs to and so um, this idea of also um, removing so many um, parts that expand and contract get hot and cold um, introducing a more simple design, which is what Eve is certainly embracing, um, also should greatly impact uh, the reliability. And so I think as we look towards what EAS and the FA are saying regarding the, the very similar safety standards, if not the exact same for what we see today in commercial and air transport aviation, um, we're, we're all we're all rowing in the same direction towards that goal. Okay, thank you, David. Now, Dave, Dave, Dave from Bristow as well. So we're not. Re are we replacing helicopters here, or is this a? Are you seeing a fundamentally new market and then a business opportunity? You know, for for your company, an expansion mode. Well, I'll speak for. I'll only speak for Bristow, and no, we're not replacing our helicopters today. This is an expansion or an addition to the services that we provide our customers. Uh, just by virtue of the things that David said and the cost and the noise, uh, uh, will allow us to operate in different environments. We'll likely be replacing trucks then and, and and vehicles or land vehicles before we replace helicopters in, in the near term. I certainly think there's a market for, for sims like tourism that might not be within Bristow's spoke where it might replace some helicopters and maybe in some of the air medical side of things in the near term, but long term we're 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 
we continue to we're, we're we're moving a parallel path and expanding our marketplace yeah no certainly you know and there are lots of different types of application as use use cases as the vernacular says yeah. but what's the risk in here for Brits? is there very much risk you're backing quite a few horses here dave which is obviously a deliberate strategy um but what what is it that you bring to that party is it your you know your sort of your operator ip just explain what it is that why you're so attractive if, if you like and others but you know you're one of those that is very attractive well, one, it's 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 to make this a reality. It's important for for us at Bristow to to help the the global sustainability process, and we think that's that's part of it. We also bring our intellectual property, and we're using our intellectual property, our ability to operate, our know how, our footprint around the world as as currency to work with all of these great partners. Uh, we have put some capital in place, uh, very very de minimis capital as a relative to to Bristow's side. And as we move through, and these aircraft are you know, going through the process of our process, if you're in the UK, of certification, uh, then then we'll be putting uh, more of our we'll be taking away our intellectual property as capital and currency, and using uh, hard currency for for that. So the risk has been uh, the amount of time and effort that my, me and my team are putting for it. We have a very sizable team that are focusing on this, are and 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 really reputational because we really believe in this. Uh, we think this is a reality. It's important for the globe. It's important for our business. And as David mentioned earlier about the distributed electric propulsion systems, the removal of components, it's a compelling business. It can be a very compelling business. Helicopters are super expensive to buy and really expensive to operate in complexity. So if we could take and fix one of those components, either CapEx or OpEx, uh, you can build a very compelling business around, around advanced air mobility. Mm -hmm. Andrew, did you want to come in with a point? I noticed you come off mute there. I, I just thought Dave started us in the right place for the whole conversation, which is safety. And we, we've all talked about how this is off, offers an opportunity to make things more safe. I think there's a link to the safety in some of the use cases as well, because I completely agree this is an expansion as much as a replacement, more so than that. But it is interesting when you think of um, one of the things that's constrained, for example, more civilian operations over urban centers with helicopters is safety concerns. You know, things like that um, horrible crash on the Pan Am building in, in Manhattan many decades ago is one of the reasons why you don't have some of those, those services being offered. So I think there's not only is safety the right thing to do, obviously, and not only is it designing it in safe, like David was talking about, utterly, utterly critical, but it's one of the things that actually creates excitement and interest around this in terms of uses. Mm. No, good point there. Thank you. Eric, did you want to jump in with a point? Yeah, I, I think you know, one of the interesting things that we see at Vertigo, since we're on the propulsion side of the business, is a lot of different approaches to electrification and, and different types of aircraft with different missions. And I think just to echo what was said, this is not so much a replacement for the helicopter as you know, most of the VTOL aircraft in that the, we see uh, under development are blurring the lines between an aircraft and a helicopter. You know, helicopters are really optimal when they're hovering. And the faster you go or the, the farther you want to cruise, the less optimal it is and you'd rather have an aircraft. And I think one of the things that comes along with distributed electric propulsion is the ability to have different configurations to the aircraft that you know, give you some of the attributes of an airplane in cruise while retaining the vertical takeoff and landing capabilities that you want out of the helicopter, but perhaps no longer being optimized to hover for extended periods of time. You know, I, I like to say that if you want to do a search and rescue mission, at least from my point of view, you still want a helicopter. You want to be able to hover for extended periods of time over that person you're rescuing. On the other hand, if all you care about is taking off vertically and then immediately getting into cruise and going somewhere and only going into vertical flight for the last 30 seconds of the flight as you're landing, then a lot of these eVTOL configurations are a much more efficient, higher performance way to achieve things in a helicopter. So it's just a fundamentally different type of aircraft that at least in the mm. civilian market, we haven't really had access to so far. Right. Well, that's a great point. I'm sure we'll amplify that as we go on. Great. Well, Dave, I think I think we get it. I think um, you know Bristow's is is there. We're is there. It's doing its thing. Let's um let's move on to our next dragon. 
Um, pretty much we're on time as well. So that's a reset. Bosch, Bosch. So Dave uh, from Eve, over to you now. The floor is yours. Uh, all right. Thanks very much, Mark. And uh, good morning, afternoon to everyone who's joining today. It's a pleasure to be here and to share a little bit more about what we're working on collectively as an industry. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So Eve uh, is a company that spun out of uh, Embraer's disruptive innovation subsidiary, Embraer X. Uh, last uh, year we went public, uh, but we've been around as an organization for several years. Um, we're an organization that, of course, is building uh, an electric vertical takeoff and land aircraft. Uh, but due to the fact that we come from Embraer, uh, we're very fortunate to have access to a lot of skills and resources that um, Embraer has been able to offer for decades as a very trusted and, and well-known uh, aircraft manufacturer. And so for over 50 years, Embraer has been in the business of servicing and supporting aircraft that fly around the world in different segments that Embraer sells uh, into, including uh, executive, commercial, and defense and security. And so as a result of that, we've established a very strong service and support network with field service technicians, MRO facilities around the world. And so beside our eVTOL, our agnostic service and support offering uh, in, in almost any location on the planet can make sure that not only our aircraft can fly safe, but those other manufacturers and operators that choose to partner with EVE's uh, existing service and support network as an extension of Embraer. Um, uh, we'll find the same dispatch reliability that many of our operators are able to enjoy today. Uh, in addition to that, because uh, the Ember Group also has uh, existing air traffic control software that is used with the Brazilian Air Navigation Service Provider, India's Air Navigation Service Provider, and a few other countries, um, we have access to um, a, a very uh, unique um, portfolio of air traffic control software that has been used to cultivate the world's largest air taxi market, which is Sao Paulo, that has almost 1,300 air taxi operations every day. And so when you think about the type of software and the procedures that are needed to create that type of operating environment, um, we've we've certainly established ourselves as a very strong player in this niche space. And so as Eve believes that we, we need to create a more uh, favorable operating environment for this industry to scale safely so that uh, operators like Bristow and, and Dave can, can really reach the volume of flights that they'd like to achieve while still respecting safety standards and separation requirements. We believe a new paradigm of air traffic management software is needed in order for us to achieve that. So we've been partnering with Embraer to develop that software. And we recently announced that um, we're proceeding um, from uh, the, the viability to, to the commercial development of the software. So that's a really nice step for Eve. And so overall, um, we're much more than just an aircraft manufacturer. We're in a lot of other spaces that we're very happy to offer agnostic uh, and an agnostic nature to the public so that we can really make sure that um, the way that this industry is introduced can be done so safely, reliably, uh, and with the manufacturer and, and service provider that has been doing this uh, for many years. Next slide, please. So over the last um, several years that uh, the commercial team has been supporting EVE and in our development as a company, we've uh, achieved a backlog of um, over 2,800 aircraft. Some of that will be announced in the coming weeks. Uh, and some of those operators that you see here um, include the, the largest backlog uh, with rotorcraft and vertical lift operators. And so we think that that's a tremendous vote of confidence for the very simple and intuitive design that uh, EVE has chosen. Uh, we have customers in, in six continents around the world and in uh, over 10 countries. And so it's it's uh, exciting for us to understand where we're going to prioritize in terms of our initial rollout. And, and based on that, uh, we've been working very closely with our customers this year to understand their launch markets and preparing their cities uh, for day one operation. And so I think as we continue to collaborate as an industry, um, Eve has been very proud to um, lead concepts of operation in multiple countries around the world. We've, we've invited our peers like Vertical Aerospace, for example, to partner with us in the UK. Uh, we've also uh, had projects in Australia, Miami, Rio, Japan, uh, Bangalore, India, uh, just to name a few others. And so um, the amount of work that we're all doing to make sure that this industry has a bright future uh, while we're building the aircraft is, is really seen in the type of community engagement that we've been doing so that we really understand how to close the gap between where we are today and, and where we need to be in order for these aircraft to start flying uh, in just a few short years from now. Dave, thank you. Well, great. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, so it's clear that building the aircraft is one thing, 
and building the infrastructure and getting all of the players together that are going to make make operations a reality is another thing, right? Um, are you on target with the aircraft part, first of all, the vehicle, the platform? I know you've just done some more testing and stuff. So just sure. give us a thought about that. Sure. Yeah. So we've um, we've been, uh, I think, a, a little conservative since the beginning and saying that we plan on certifying by 2020. Uh, six and delivering in 2026 and so we think that that will still continue um naturally there there are things that as an industry we're all learning in terms of how um this uh this industry is unfolding in terms of building the supply chain making sure that we're comfortable with the technology and and going through that supplier selection process and so um uh, I think Eve, it, together with Embraer, who is is working with Eve to build and manufacture this aircraft, um, sees, uh, I think, an on-time certification schedule based on what we've been sharing with the market, as well as our last quarterly release uh, that we shared a few weeks ago. Supplier selection will continue throughout the year, as well as um, ongoing prototype build um, of, of the various uh, POC 1, POC 2s that, that we have in Eve. Uh, it's important to demonstrate the different phases of flight uh, and that they're viable and 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 that we can meet the safety expectations that Embraer is, is obviously very familiar with. And so that's what we're doing this year and, and how we plan on um, marching towards our goal in 2026. No, thank you, David. And how do you feel about, in you, the, you know, the concept of operations is this operational side. I mean, are, are are we as advanced on that side of things, i.e. being ready to operate on day one as you would like to see the industry, or is, or is there more work to be done in that area, perhaps? So I, I think that every city has a unique starting point. Uh, Sao Paulo has a different starting point than Singapore, than Denver, than Miami, than London. Uh, but what's interesting is that there's no necessarily prerequisite for existing infrastructure that's needed. I think Singapore has done a very interesting job, for example, of demonstrating how quickly you can go from having no previous procedures or infrastructure for, for a vertical lift industry to being one of the, the first early adopters, let's say, of the EVTOL industry. At least that's their continued intention as far as they've made it aware for the public. Uh, and so I think our job as an industry is to make sure that we understand what every city's needs are that is positioning itself to be an early adopter so that we can understand what can we take advantage of in terms of existing infrastructure and and, and how to close that gap so we know how to make sure day one is viable and and some of those things are shared around the world for example energy studies so if if several manufacturers for example and their operator customers plan on going to a certain city uh, to begin operations, we all need to collaborate together and share information so that the local utility company knows how much energy supply they really need to provide to to the different um, vertiports to make sure that everyone has equitable access to the electrical grid so that they can charge their aircraft. Uh, and and that's something that I think has has um, started certainly, and um, there's certainly more work to do there in order to make sure that some information can be shared so that. Uh, our common stakeholder, like the city, like the utility company, uh, and public infrastructure entities, understand what's expected of them. Mm. Uh, and, yeah, and that's now what we can really do to to pull them more into the conversation, so that they're made aware of what their role is, and and, and they can partner. Dave, did you, Dave from Bristow, did you want to jump in with a with an additional thought? Uh, yes, indeed. I think David and and Andrew will be familiar with this. And and back to what Bristow brings. So when you think about when it's when aviation started. In, in, after the Wright brothers, you know, we didn't start United Airlines straight away. We went through a process of, of, of operations, a pragmatic approach, move the mail, move stuff. And we believe that, I mean, the initial re options for, for operations for Bristow is going to be into some sort of a constrained environment, uh, prove that we can operate these aircraft safely, reliably, and efficiently to ourselves, and then allow us to expand our applications to gain both the regulator's trust and confidence and the public's trust and confidence. And, and that's why I bring it. And as part of that, as David talked about collaboration, uh, we have formed a operational safety consortium for a, of a, a group of operators around the world that are going to be working in advanced air mobility. And we've built a charter and we're modeling after an oper a, a similar organization that's in the road, traditional roadcraft business so we can collaborate and share on safety of operations, health of the aircraft, whether it's operating in Malaysia, Boston, London. Um, and, and and we've got a lot of a lot of great uh, companies that are involved there, and we're very excited about it. That'll probably be 
form, formally launching in, in early 24. Right. No, that's great to hear. And that's great standard industry practice in a sense, isn't it? Because that's what the industry is good at. Get ahead of the curve before just, we start operating. Well, yeah. and it's that collaborative nature to all push forward. So, so Dave, if you were a betting man, um, you know, you've got lots of these uh, concept of operations going on. People are studying and things where, where you know, these aircraft might well be certified by 26. When are you going to get your hands on one and start operating it for real? I'm assuming this is for me. Yeah. Yeah, it is. You're an operator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're the. Uh, I, I believe. I, I believe. Well, uh, as soon as they're ready, we'll be ready. We we. One of the reasons that we've got got in this early is we want to be a leader and and start the operational practices. So whether it's 2025 or 2026 or 2027, you know we're we're formulating our plans to be ready. And if and if schedules move, certification is a subjective manner in many cases so we'll we'll we'll, we'll we're going to watch it appropriately we're going to participate hopefully we'll be able to participate in some pre-certification operations to to help the the proving of the systems so we think we'll get our hands on some of these vehicles in 25 and 26 whether you want to be a leader that's what you're at you're in for you want to be a leader you want to be helping shape this industry and take advantage early we do and and and, and it's not important to be for us to be first but we want to be a leader Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah. it's it's we're not trying to be the first. We're just trying to be a leader and, and bring the technologies that we've evolved over the years to to this industry to make it happen. Sure. Sure. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dave, uh, for, for bringing the Bristow yeah. view to the end. And thank you, Dave Rockblatt, for, for your pitch. And that was really good. Well, we come, some of these themes we'll come back to. So let's go to our third dragon, which is Eric. Um, so, so Vertigo, give us give us what it is you're betting on, please, Eric. So Vertigo, just for a little bit of background, we are a company built around delivering hybrid electric power plants. And if we can go to the next slide, uh, really the, the founding team at Vertigo, uh, we, we all had similar histories with electrification of flight where we've been participating in, in some cases for more than 10 years. I just came up on the 10 year anniversary of my first flight at the controls of a battery electric aircraft. So we've been out there in the early days, really understanding what is working, but also in some cases, what is not working about electrification and, and where are the real payoffs. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we, we've we really seen that there are, you know, the big idea in electrification isn't necessarily the battery, it's the electric motor. The, all of these new aircraft, they look different because they have electric motors, or in many cases, arrays of electric motors. And electric motors are responsive, they're relatively lightweight, they're power dense. There are a lot of great things about electric motors when it comes to propelling an aircraft and designing new types of highly reliable, highly redundant aircraft. And so, these aircraft fundamentally have to be electrified. There is no other way to, to do the aircraft and, and doing them with conventional propulsion would make about as much sense as doing an F-16 with a piston engine. You know, there, there are certain types of propulsion that really fit certain types of aircraft. So if an aircraft has to be electrified, and usually that's due to distributed electric propulsion, although certainly not always, and those mission requirements for the aircraft demand high performance, and that is true in a lot of cases, then having a hybrid system where you can use sustainable fuels, you can use existing fuel stocks, uh, but you can use the benefits of liquid fuels and SAP and e-fuels to power that electric aircraft. And the hybrid system is kind of that link between the world of electrification and the world of sustainable fuels. So really our focus at Vertigo is on the propulsion systems that go inside these next generation of aircraft that must be electric, but in a lot of cases, these aircraft also must not be solely powered by batteries. And therefore there needs to be another answer. Those are the cases that Vertigo comes into. Next slide. So our hybrid power plants are combinations of an aerospace certified engine that is then modified and turned into something that has an engine, a generator motor, power electronics, control systems, thermal management systems, 
basically everything that the airframer needs so that they can put sustainable fuels in one end and get electricity out the other end. And we are typically paired up with a battery pack. There are some good reasons to put batteries in an aircraft and also some not so good reasons to put air batteries in an aircraft. So we love batteries as long as it's the right tool for the right job. And we often are installed alongside a battery pack that plays some of the role in supporting some of the elements of the mission. So, you know, our hybrid power plants, our current programs range from 150 kilowatts of continuous power to more than a megawatt. Uh, we've already delivered power plants to development customers for use in test aircraft. And we've got actually power plants running today in our R&D center here in Daytona Beach, Florida. So we're very excited about where electrification is going. And at the same time, we see that the, the electric world isn't necessarily competing with the sustainable fuels world. In fact, in some cases, these two things need to be brought together. And that's how we really get where we need to go uh, over the next couple of decades. So next slide. Eric, I'm going to ask, can, can we go to, can, can we, you just sort of wrap up and then we'll get into the, the chit chat? This is the wrap up slide. So I was just wrap up. Say, Excellent. We, we do high performance hybrids with real world solutions and happy to take questions. So, Eric, let, let's just let's just make sure I get on that. I understand fully here. Are we talking about a hybrid solution is an interim solution to um, when battery power or battery batteries become better than they are today and therefore applicable to uh, aircraft like vertical, like uh, EVE, et cetera. What are we talking about? So in some cases, it may be an interim solution. In a lot of cases, I think it's the long-term solution. You know, the all of the work that's going on on sustainable fuels is really impressive. They're certified, they're useful, the technology exists. There's a supply chain concern there are cost concerns that are being addressed, but there are a lot of smart people working on that right now, and those curves are coming down. As that advances, I think we have to ask the question, do we really need to build charging infrastructure everywhere in the world, or can we repurpose the infrastructure that already exists globally yeah. for handling liquid fuels? So I think there's a long-term case for electrified aircraft running on SAF in many cases and in many locations around the sure. world. Okay. And well, let's put the, let's put, never get there. Yeah, let's put the question to Andrew and David first. So Andrew, I mean, um, vertical is, at the, I think, is a purely electrical, in terms of electrical motor plus a battery uh, power source. Is is What's your, what's your sort of reaction to, to this view from Eric? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, we have looked at hybrid, um, both uh liquid fuels and, and hydrogen type hydrogen um we can see it being a solution in the future in terms of range and payload and other extension we think we are focusing initially with our vx4 our, our, um first aircraft on uh, an all-battery solution because we think you you solve those um challenges around electrification around a battery powertrain first and there's a viable product there that you start with and we've been talking as we've gone through haven't we about you know, starting with something and then building from there. So that's kind of the approach we've taken. But I think one of the things that, that Eric was making me think and ask the question was, okay, if there are things that batteries work for and things that um, uh, liquid engines work for, what what are the things that in his view are the, are the, are the battery, uh, that batteries best suited for? Which bits of the mission and what kind of activity? So if, I guess if I could jump in and answer that, I would yeah. say there's a continuum. And so it, it depends on, the range, it depends on the type of flying, it depends on how much reserve energy you have on board. And, you know, batteries aren't good or bad and hybrids aren't good or bad. They're just different tools for different types of missions. And so if you've got a very short mission that has relatively low need for reserve energy, batteries may be fine. You know, I've, I've got personal experience with battery electric aircraft and there's some really interesting things you can do. On the other end of the spectrum, if you want to go fast, if you want to go far, if you want to carry heavier loads, those are things that are really hard to do with batteries, and that's not going to change in the coming decades, probably in our careers. That won't, we won't get all the way there. 
So at some point in the continuum, you have to say, okay, if you want to fly those missions, but you have a really good reason for the aircraft fundamentally being electrified, how do you do it? And and that's where we come in. You know, we're we're not the solution for every aspect of electric flight, but there are many missions and many aircraft where what Vertigo does is very relevant. Dave, Dave, um, which, whichever Dave Rotblatt or step in, please jump in and yeah, give I'm your happy to jump in. in. I'm happy to jump in because I I every I agree with everything my colleagues have said. And, and if you noted on the the picture of my first slides, we we have partnered with several companies that are uh, certifying hybrid electric systems. Yep. Just as as Eric pointed out, uh, it, it's just it's just it, it equates to just like aircraft. You have turboprops, you have jet engines. There's mission profiles for each of them, not good or bad, just depending on how they are. And today, in today's world, whether it's infrastructure, range, specifically from remote locations, moving stuff and people, longer range with hybrid electric, bringing them into a hub, and then moving in them on that shorter range with the pure electric aircraft. That's the networks that we're envisioning. It's synergistic, uh, yeah. and it it is long term. And we're we are a, we're a buyer of sustainable aviation fuel. Eric's right; it's hard 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 to get supply for it, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop. We got to keep moving forward to keep that market generating. And as more hybrid electric systems are developed uh, and the advanced mobility space grows, then the infrastructure will grow. Propulsion uh, fuel systems and, and energy systems will change. And the beauty of the electric propulsion system is you're not changing an engine, you're just changing the source of the energy. So if you got geography yes. on the aircraft, you can replace hybrid or you can add hybrid. You can do what's necessary to, to make it work because distributed electric propulsion system opens up a lot of avenues. Mm, uh, that's a good perspective, Dave. Thank you. Dave Rockblatt from Eve. What, what, what's your, where are you? You're on mute, by the way. Just um, what's, what's Eve's take here? So um, I think that Eve is really committed to making a, a very cost-effective aircraft to own and operate. We're really committed to achieving as friendly and noise profile as possible and to accomplish the sustainability goals that we've been out to achieve from the beginning. There's certainly, like everyone has said, trade-offs with one model versus another. Um, ultimately, if, if we're going to fulfill the promise and the commitment that we've made to make a more accessible price point, we're doing everything that we can to design an aircraft that can afford that accessibility. And, and that's really something that you've is is really working very hard to achieve is accessibility accessibility from from a physical perspective as well as from a financial perspective and an environmental perspective and so um based on the research that we've done with our customers that have signed with us the bulk of those are really interested in use cases where um there's there's a significant amount of time lost in cities where the distance may not be as great but the amount of time lost to get from point a to point b is really extreme and so um if if you let's say overlay our our our, our loi backlog uh, on a map of the world you'll see that many of those operators operate in places where the pain point like that exists and so we think that our all-electric aircraft is is suited to accomplish the mission that our customers have purchased the e-vehicle to accomplish number one and again i, I think from designing an aircraft to accomplish th those accessibility goals um we we think that we can best do that with an electric version so that not only is it more cost effective per the talking points that dave mentioned earlier but also um so, so that it, it's easier to maintain and return to service if it does need um some some aircraft downtime for periodic routine maintenance uh the, the more complexity that's introduced into the aircraft the higher the likelihood in, in our opinion for things like airworthiness directives for greater maintenance costs that make it harder to pass on a more accessible price point to the customer. And then and then it, it, it might not accomplish the goal of us being able to provide an option that more people can afford to get somewhere safely and sustainably. So um, that being said, however, Eve is always open, but that's that's our choice for now. Yes, okay, you're always open, but you're, you're sort of sticking with the all electric right through the powertrain for the, with batteries for the time being, right? Great. Well, we'll come back to that as well if we need to. Um, okay, we can obviously as we come back to the Q and A. But th thank you very much, Eric, uh, bringing hybridization to to the to the table in such an eloquent way. Thank you. So now we go to our final den, our final Shark Tank member, Andrew from Vict from Vertical. Please uh, tell us about your approach, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Vertical Aerospace. For those who don't know us, we're based in the UK. 
Um, we're building the BX4. You can see a picture of it on the slide there, uh, which is another electric, all electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft with a wing that um, is capable of doing the missions we've been talking about. We have over 300 engineers, mostly based in Bristol, um, and we are working to certify the aircraft with the UK CAA to start with, and then with the FAA, ASA, uh, JCAB, ANAC um, around the world. And we have indeed a range of customers with an order book of over five and a half billion US dollars uh, of, of pre-order bad, pre value. I thought what I'd talk about today is not just vertical particularly, but a, a broader theme of partnership and how we make this come together. Um, I think partnership is central to certainly vertical strategy, but I think it's a winning um, plan for this EV toll industry and this electric propulsion industry. Why? I'd say three reasons why. First, we think it shares the risk and the challenge. There's a lot to do and partnership allows everybody to focus on a few things and do them really well. I think the second thing, and this has already come up in the conversation, is for us anyway, it brings an extraordinary range of expertise and knowledge, particularly from aviation and aerospace, to bear upon the challenge of making this real. So, I mean, Dave was talking before about Bristow and their safety and their operational expertise, and, you know, we're very privileged to be able to work with, with Bristow on that. Um, our other customers, you know, some of our airline customers, and I know... Um, Dave Reblatt's got some airline customers too, but their knowledge of branding and local networks and local markets, extraordinary. We get to work with people like Gold in Brazil or, or Virgin in, in the UK. And indeed also on the uh, technology and the industrial side. And what you can see on this slide is, is our technology and industrial partners. So for example, we have Honeywell doing our uh, avionics system. That's essentially the system that was built for the F-35. We have people like Leonardo, who are one of the biggest helicopter manufacturers in the world, producing the fuselage. And it's amazing when you sit in the room with a bunch of Leonardo engineers and they tell you, no, no, don't do that. Don't do this. This is how we're going to do it. This is how you, you make it light and strong and safe. So that's an incredible thing to draw on. And we think drawing on that expertise is powerful. And the third reason I'd say partnership really works is it builds confidence. It builds confidence with regulators, first of all, if you're taking these kind of partners to, um, uh, to, to the regulators, that gives them confidence. It builds confidence with customers and, and indeed with other stakeholders. And if we flick onto the next side, you can see our customers around the world. Again, we've very much gone for top tier capabilities, people who really bring things, whether it's on the industrial side, as we're showing, or on the uh, customer side, and a mix of people too. So again, fantastic at Bristow is the world's biggest operator of helicopters, but also big airlines like American Airlines, like Virgin, but also others. For example, a couple of weeks ago, we announced partnership with Kakar Mobility in Korea, and they are a, uh, a mobility company who bring an incredible expertise uh, and indeed confidence in their home market in Korea in being able to get people around cities and how you do that and do that well. Um, we very much believe in fewer, deeper partnerships. So we want to have partners that uh, we mean something to them and they really matter to us. Uh, but, but at the same time, we think it's an open and exclusive approach. Um, and that if you do partner openly and if everybody pushes forward, everybody wins. This is not a winner takes all. This is a matter of how do we get this to be real and joining together. You know, it takes a village. Joining together is, is the way to do it. And it gets us there faster. It gets us there with less capex um, and, and more ability to tailor to the local cities and the local conops. But I think one of the things, and I wondered if this was part of the conversation, is there are probably some trade-offs to partnering. It is a little more complex. You have to coordinate more. You have to bring everybody together. And you do occasionally get told that's not how you, you do real innovation, that you have to be some uh, you know clever guy somewhere in, I don't know, Silicon Valley or wherever it is that clever people are, uh, and that you have to think about everything afresh and anew. And I think we very much come from this from, as the, the name of our company says, an aerospace point of view and building on the tradition of what's already there and building on the partnerships that are already there. But that is slightly different from the let's throw everything up in the air and start again. But we believe, given the safety, given the need for customer, government and other um, support, and given how much there is to do, it really helps to join hands with other people and push that forward. So that's my, my thought for us anyway. No, thank you, Andrew. That's that's excellent. Well, one thought that occurred to me, obviously, you know, you're out there competing with with Dave at Eve and all and there's lots of people um, you know, trying to find customers, as it were, to work with. My, my th and that's one aspect of the, the business. But my, my thought on, on with reference to the supply chain, with reference to finding those deep industrial partnerships and people that are really going to take your program forward. 
How competitive is that to find uh, people that you really think, yeah, we do you target them? Do they come to you? How competitive is that, Andrew, to find those really key partners? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there is an aspect of competition. Of course there is. And I'm, I'm sure David would, would say the same. But it's interesting that we share, and here, here is Dave Stepanek here in the room, we share customers and we also share industrial partners. For example, Rolls-Royce is one that both um, even ourselves are engaged with. And again, I think we don't see this as a zero-sum game. We see this as something where there'll be a number of winners uh, and, and a lot of people and plenty of opportunity that everybody can go after. Um, and in, I think a number of the industrial partners see this the same way. So when it comes to that engagement, what I think is more important rather than we've grabbed somebody as the partner, I think what's more important is, is it a real genuine partnership? And what is the opportunity to build things and build things that are going to um, last over the medium term? Because this is a multi-year, probably multi-decade effort to build this, this uh, industry out. And I think that that's what we focused on is getting the right kind of partners and building the right kind of relationship with them. That's what we spend a lot of our time and our energy on. Dave Stepanek, did you want to I, I do, and have a comment it, in there? I, I do, and it's it, and it's it's been a, a a key attribute of of a number of I've had the benefit of either attending and or speaking at a number of mobility events, not necessarily just related to aircraft mobility, but land, sea, rail, uh, all the way through the infrastructure of people that are building the copper cables to get the electricity to where we need it. And the key, the key message that's been coming out of each one of these is collaboration is a key competitive advantage. It's a key competitive advantage. And if we don't collaborate, then we're not going to be able to get this to the, to, to the point where we need it. Uh, and, I, and I think what you're seeing amongst this group here and, and Andrews, everybody has a different way of going about it. But collaboration is going to be a, a key effort, whether you're a regulator, whether you're a municipality, whether you're air traffic management, whether you're an OEM or an operator, we need to we need to work together to get this get this over to the goal line to bring it to the general public. Mm, yes, okay, that's a well experience. Dave tells there. Dave Rotblatt, you, do you want to come in and uh, offer Eve's thought on on this particular thought? Uh, well, I, I hope that our actions speak for themselves in terms of our our desire and and. Um, you know, passion to partner as much as possible to invite our peers. I wouldn't necessarily call them competitors right now. We're, we're peers in the industry trying to make this work. And to the extent that we will continue to, to do these types of uh, concepts of operation, understanding the, the, the depth and breadth of the capabilities of the supply chain in this industry, um, when the tide comes in in this regard, you know, it, it, it helps all ships float. Um, and so I think that uh, there will come a time naturally where industry consolidation from a very fragmented industry today will, will, will take place. And in those manufacturers that are, I think, able to demonstrate a, a reliable aircraft will, will, will be certainly those that will be able to earn the public trust as well as the trust of our operators. And that's what we're all working towards right now. Uh, and, in to, to that point, I, I think there's a lot of collaboration going on there as well, where, um, organizations like Vertical, like Eve, and many others are partnering with different trade associations to make sure that we're sharing as much as we can a common voice to different regulators. Um, uh, Congress in the United States, for example, um, NATS or, or um, the UKRI in, in the UK, for example, to say this is what we want, this is what we need, and then it helps them be able to enable us to move faster when they're they're hearing a cohesive voice. And so it's in this respect that we're also partnering, collaborating by by all these manufacturers and in some cases operators as well, joining these different trade associations, partnering in these collaborative projects like Future Flight Three with the UKRI in the UK, for example, um, to to work towards a common good. And so I think yeah. um, if I was um, a, a, a future potential passenger or one of the listeners in today's webinar just thinking to myself, how is everybody working together? It's good for you to know that these things are happening. We might not talk about it all the time on LinkedIn or in our press releases, but there's a tremendous amount of collaboration going on behind the scenes to make sure that those that are um, charged with the mission of making sure this industry has a successful and safe start um, are, are hearing from all of us at the same time. And, and so uh, to, to that point, I'm, I'm very encouraged that, uh, sure. that we've been doing such a good job up until now. Yeah, sure. No, that's well said. But one thing I just wanted to sort of, as I was listening to you, is 
the timeline here, um, everybody, it, are you a little bit surprised that it's taken perhaps the timeline corrections are going out rather than coming closer in terms of achieving um, either, you know, flight certification, getting these collaborations ready so you can actually field uh, an aircraft in a real live scenario. Are, are you surprised at how long it's been taking? Has that has that sort of has that been something that's characterized the, this period and will indeed characterize it for a little bit longer? Dave, do you want to start? Dave Rockblatt? Sure. So uh, I, I think it's important to to view that optimistically. I think that everyone is really being very deliberate and careful with what is needed in order to make sure that we're we're bringing a safe product to market. I think that as we learn more and, and we recalibrate our expectations and the expectations of the market for um, the, the way in which a very safe product will be brought to market, I, I'm sure passengers would want us to take all the time that's needed, while at the same time making sure that those that we're accountable to um, have a good understanding of, of the reasons why. And so um, beyond just the, the technical difficulties of building an aircraft like this, I, I'm also uh, honestly um, pleased that we are, that the industry is, I think, giving itself more time because even if all of these aircraft were, were built and certified and delivered to the customer as originally stated two years ago, let's say, the cities, I don't think, would be ready. And so we really need to, to I think, accelerate and use the, the benefit of some of these extensions to our advantage to make sure that the cities have a plan, they understand what's expected of them so that they can work with us to make sure that the vertiport locations that our operators are choosing are ready, uh, they have access to the electrical grid, and, and that will take time. In some cases, perhaps more time than the amount of time it will take to build, deliver, and certify an aircraft. And so uh, I, I think that this is ultimately good news in terms of our ability to prepare the ecosystem as well as a safe aircraft. And um, uh, all, all great things, you know, come come in time. And I'd just like to point out that, um, you know, in, in the 60s, we, we built a rocket that landed on the moon with less computing power than most of us carry in our pocket every day. And so we'll build this too. This the, we, 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 People today, we, we can build and do anything. The question is, to what standard? Uh, to make sure that the surrounding ecosystem is ready for us. And, and that is certainly a part of, of the overall timeline and the critical path. Sure, sure. Let's just move on to another question, unless you, anybody else wants to come in on that, so, which is come in from the, from the users. So James and Darren, and maybe some others, no doubt's in their head as well. It, the point is made that aviation has many autonomous systems. And of course, in this area, there are some who think that EV tolls, uh, AAM, should be should have a, a pilotless and autonomous future as well. Um, what is, what's your feeling about automation? Um, perhaps Dave, from an operator point of view, could kick in first. Well, I, I just want to challenge what, what's the purpose of the automation? Is If the purpose is to bring a higher level of safety to the system, which it may do that, I think it's important. Um, it's also important that we go about the autonomous portion of this pragmatically. Today, we do operate uh, un uncrewed aircraft at, at Bristow. We, we operate UASs in the, in, the, in the United Kingdom for His Majesty's Coast Guard. So we have some capability in remotely piloted our uncrewed aircraft. And I think the system will go through a process where I like to see more of an augmented cockpit where you have a single pilot with uh, the augmentation of, of advanced technologies. But with advanced technologies comes risks as well, as we've seen in, in, in some of the incidents that have occurred over the last few years with higher automation and reliance on automation uh, when things go um, not quite the way they're supposed to and how the, the, the crews react. So I think it's coming. It's going to it's going to happen. There's been some all the all the OEMs, including the ones here and the ones that are traditional, have built automated systems, whether it's Airbus or Bell or Sikorsky or Leonardo. Uh, so we can we can get there, but it's gonna it's gonna go through a, a, a very lengthy process. We're planning on keeping crews in, involved in the process. We do have one of our partners that's a remotely piloted vehicle, Elroy Air, which we're going to use the technologies that we've uh, we've developed with the uh, the unmanned systems we're operating in the United Kingdom. Anybody else want to jump? Andrew, did you want to talk about pilot just for for a second? Your views at Vertical. Um... Well, I think Dave said it very well. You don't automate just for the sake of it. You do it for safety or you do it for performance um, over time. I think, and there is a difference between autonomous flight 
not having a pilot and um, automation. Um, and we see a lot of automation. If you take that Honeywell um, system we've got uh, in the VX4, it's very simple. I mean, I'm not a pilot and I can fly it um, with reasonable success and I'm completely useless with most simulators. Um, but the, uh, so, so there's already a lot there and that's deliberately brought in. I mean, our chief test pilot was involved in developing that system for the F-35 barrier precisely to take load off pilots for safety reasons, particularly when flying this kind of on a wing and then also doing a, a vertical piece. So that's fantastic. But we think that truly taking the pilot out, at least for passenger operations, leave aside things like Dave's talking about with the young man in the Coast Guard and so forth, um, for passenger operations, we think regulators, passengers, passengers themselves, the general public, will expect a pilot in the aircraft for quite a long time. Eventually, yes, technologically, it's absolutely possible, I'm sure, but um, mm. it'll, it'll take a while. Okay, great. Eric, there's another question coming here about electrification and, and some thoughts from you. Are, are you working on hydrogen at all because electric and maybe... Um, uh, propulsion has, has its limitations. Is that something or is that farther down the line for you? So we have done some work with hydrogen specific. Well, we've looked into both fuel cells and hydrogen combustion. And I would say some of our systems that we already have under development could be produced in a hydrogen combustion variant. I, I guess I would classify myself as intrigued by hydrogen and also skeptical of hydrogen at the same time. Um, it's, it's an interesting way to package energy. And really when we talk about batteries or hydrogen or liquid fuels, SAF, jet fuel, these are all just different ways to package energy and put it on the aircraft. You have to have energy in the aircraft. One of the Eric, Eric, let's 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 sorry, I'll, we'll leave that there. I'll just ask. I'm going to ask each of you sort of a wrap up question here, just as so okay. as we come to the top of the hour. But thank you, Eric. I, I appreciate yep. that um, that you 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 know you've looked at it, which is important. Maybe yes. one day you never know. Um, just just really a wrap up question. In a year's time, let's just all reflect just for a for a couple of seconds. Where do you want to be with the with AAM? Where what's going to be the sort of thing you want to answer in say a year in, in a year? Maybe that's not, maybe that's too short a time period, but I want to sort of compress it so we can actually yeah. say, yeah, Good. in a year, we're going to be there. What, what's your thought? And who wants to kick off? I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. I, I mean, Thanks, we'd Dave. like to have our, our planned uh, initial op operation uh, organized. Uh, we would like to be able to operate a, a pre-certified or, or have participated in the pre-certification processes to operate an aircraft within some sort of a sandbox operation. And mm. I know we only got three minutes left, so I'll stop there. So you, but sorry, Dave, you're talking about an actual operation with an actual vehicle in flying, some sort of trial, real, in some kind of pilot. Flying to real AAM aircraft, that's correct. Yeah, no, very nice, excellent. Um, who, was, who wants to go next? Well, I'd, I'd second that. I think in a year's time, we'll see uh, a lot more flying, a full scale with pilots. There hasn't been a lot of that um, up to this point and doing the full, uh, more of the full envelope and the full capabilities of the aircraft. And I think that will, when people start to see that, and see that being demonstrated, people will really start to get excited and believe. That's where. And I think is that in your timeline plan, Andrew? Yeah, we'll be we're doing considerably more flying and, and pushing that envelope at sure. full scale over the next twelve months. Sure, sure. Eric, we'll have hardware flying in a variety of aircraft, including some non AAM aircraft, which which helps us mature technologies that then have a payoff in the AAM market. Right. Okay. Good. Well, this is. This is great, uh, Dave. Um, what's your what's what's Eve's uh, thinking here? So beyond more flying, which I think we all concur with, um, one thing that I expect to see in a year from now is um, launch cities identified from the operators that plan on um, their initial deployments, as well as a very concrete plan that those cities will have in order to make themselves ready. And what would you what would your bet be for the first couple of cities, Dave? Singapore's coming up high. Sao Paulo. I, I think, you know what, I, I think a lot of those cities today that already have very mature urban mobility operations are, are, are strong indicators that they'll continue to, to be the leader in that. Um, we're certainly expecting Sao Paulo to be one of them, sure. Yeah, it could be a true differentiator for a city that sort of gets, gets it, and especially a congested one might be very intriguing. That's okay. really great. I really appreciate that. That was quite nice. That worked out nice in the next year. We've come back in a year's time and see how we've got on. Um, 
Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Dave, to Dave, to Andrew and Eric. Thank you so much for your contributions. I trust that we've all got a you know, better handle on the advanced air mobility sector, how it could be an industry disruptor and some of the challenges you know, to make it a reality. And I really appreciate you, uh, you, you guys here, you gentlemen. Thank you so much for your attendance. To all of you audience, for your questions, to our sponsor, Pratt & Whitney as well, of course. Um, the webinar will be available on demand shortly after this to watch at your leisure. Um, and our next webinar will be later on in the year, actually, where we're going to be looking at the decarbonization the decarbonization pathway for business aviation. And that's set for 5th of October. Gosh, that seems a long way away, doesn't it already? Well, no doubt these guys here will be flying their products much in advance of that. And we'll look forward to reporting on that in Flight Global. So look out for that, both the reporting and the next webinar. That leaves me to say again, thank you to everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your yeah. time. I wish you all a very good day wherever you are in the world and very goodbye. Thank you from me, Mark Pilling. Until the next time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.